All right, all right, all right. Since we are live, welcome back to another Game Dog Talk on Thursdays. Salute to the chat. Salute to the panel. Uh, Ram not here yet. I'm sure he's going to jump on in a second. Right now, we got uh, the brother Blitz in the building. What's up, Blitz? How you doing? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Thanks for having me here. Yes, indeed. And, of course, we have the legendary Mr. Richard Garcia, schoolboy. How you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. Hey, everybody. Right, right. Salute to the chat. Let me see who we got here. Uh, let me see here. Make sure I got my banners going, too. Banners going. All right. We got Dylan G. What's happening, man? Salute. Uh, Jeff, the producer, what's good? Miami Snoopy 305, what's happening, man? Wayne Fielder, salute. Um, Hardy Dogs, Pennsylvania, salute, man. We got uh, Mike Lee in the building, salute. Mark Wonderlands, what's happening? Uh, Boss Dog Kennel, salute. JT Sporting Dog Enthusiast, salute. AJ. We got Peanut 202. We got... Uh, Kondo Sami Hassan, salute. Frank Troy. Vernon Stone, salute. Much love in the super chat. Uh, Christopher Jordanette in that super chat, salute. He says, salute 78 in the family, 100. Much love, brother. Um, FTB Kennels. Bam Bam. We got uh, Bank Statement Bully, salute, homie. Young World. Jamie, Abby, Tony. Uh, let's see here. Dead Game Boxing, the homie Main Event Mark, Laquan Mason, uh, Devo F, Drew the Dog Man, salute. Haynes Gang Bullies, all right, all right. <clears throat> okay, it's starting to come on in here. Everybody's starting to make their way in. All right, so we got a few topics, y'all. We're going to cover real quick. Uh, Ram just texted me. He on, he on his way. So we're gonna knock out a few topics here. Uh, first, uh, while we're waiting on, on Ram, uh, Mr. Garcia, want you to let everybody know. I mean, I know this is a redundant question, but you know, but for, for the people out there who may not know, who may just not be joining, maybe they don't they don't know who you are. Can you tell people um, uh, when you got into the dogs? When? Yeah, when you got into the dogs, and what's your history with the dogs? Uh, well, I got into. I was a big boxing fan, and it kind of kind of bled over to that. You know, I like. I like the game foul too, but you know, it, that's, that's, they're a little bit different. I like horse racing, horse racing too expensive. So kind of led me to the dog, but I got involved starting in 1978. And, uh, you know, I got it back then, you know, speaking of the past, you know, I got into it strictly for the competition, you know, right. I wanted to do something with, uh, with my dogs and that I didn't start breeding till a few years later. And, uh, you know, I had Heinzel dogs, Bully Sun dogs, you know. I really liked the Boyles dogs, and then eventually I had uh, – I got some Jeep Red Boy dogs. Jeep dogs and Jeep Red Boy dogs from, uh, from Dunlady, the one who broke big uh, Right. And uh, that's basically how it started. Just went from there, you know. You do some traveling, you visit. And, and I, I got involved in all aspects, judging confirmation shows and weight pools, you know. And and uh, uh, wall climbs, you know, in a few different countries and all over Mexico and the United States. And uh, you know, I like the history of it too. That that's really important. And right. the blood lines breeding, all that. I'm a, I'm a student of the breed forever and always. You know. Right. But that's how I got I got my name Schoolboy from a. a championship boxer named Bobby Chacon and that was his nickname he was my the first one that really got me interested in in uh in boxing because I was a martial artist kind of back in the day you know I studied martial arts for a little bit a few right. years and uh Benny Arquitas was one of the first full contact fighters you know in martial arts I was a big fan of his and Bobby Chacon trained him in boxing and that's kind of that's that's how I got the name. I, I stole it from him, basically. Right. <laughs> right, right. OK. And um, uh, what would you say your, your favorite dog was? My favorite dog was a dog named uh, Mr. Rowdy. 
He's uh, one of the first litters I bred. My wife bottle fed him and hand raised him. He was a two-time winner. He lost real game to uh, champion Clorox in 231. Uh, but he's just the type of dog that I like. A lot of energy, a lot of spirit, you know, good athlete. He was by Big Red out of an inbred daughter of Jeep named Sissy. Right. And, uh, that, that was probably my favorite dog. Okay, okay. All right. Let's let's get to let's get to you, Blitz. Blitz, man, tell everybody, man, um, um, what got you into these dogs, man? You know, when did you first learn about the American Pit Bull Terrier and what, what got you into them? Bro, actually, I'm I'm kinda young, you feel me? Um Yeah, absolutely. I started out uh Shit, I was the only. I start, I, man. I I was the only child, so you feel me. I had to, I was an outside type of kid, you know, just being outside, being a little boy, just walking up and down the street. You start seeing dogs through the fences. I wanted a dog, and I seen a DMX, uh, the Rough Rider, when that came out. Um, you know when they had a the dog shaking the tires and stuff, man. I always thought it was cool as hell. Like, damn, that's a any that's a that's a strong dog. He could pick up a tire with his jaws and shake it. <laughs> So right, I right. started out, um, it was this lady, it was this lady around the corner. She had some like, it was like German Shepherd, Husky, and Pitbull mix. <laughs> that was like my first dog, my own dog. My mom ain't let me have him, so I used to sneak him around the back of the house and put him on the side of the house. I used to just feed him the scraps. He ain't barking nothing. But um, my first, my first running with a real American Pitbull Terry, I was walking my dog through a park. And it was this guy I knew. He always had dogs. I never got, you know, I never had time to stop to talk to him. But he had this this buckskin, it was a little dog, half of the size of the dog I had when he grew up. Uh, it, it, little blocky, little little buckskin, black mass dog, big collar, long leash. He was just out there chasing squirrels at top speed, like ripping right. up the grass as he ran by. And I'm like, damn, what is that? So I'm thinking it was a puppy. So I went and talked to him. But he was telling me, like, yo, keep your distance with your dog. Like, don't come too close. And I'm just a little boy. I'm like, bro, they can play. They cool. Like, you feel me? And my dog don't bite. But he like, bro, this ain't no puppy. And you can't get too close to this dog. So I'm asking him. I'm interested now. So I'm asking him about it. And he explaining, you feel me, just right. what these dogs are for, um, how they're bred. Because I'm, I'm telling him, yeah, mine's is half pit bull. He looking at me crazy. Like, man, if you don't get that snarf, that mud out of here. That's a, <laughs> like just you feel me giving it little weird names. Like right. after I'm like, what the hell is a uh what do you used to call it? Uh scatterbred. I'm like, well, this is a pit bull. He like, hell to hell. No, that ain't no damn pit bull. Right, right. That is a scatterbred dog. So he started teaching me about pedigree. I I say what I was like, you feel me? Like like 12, 12, no, nah, I'm gonna say 11, 12, I got into the dogs. And ever since then I've just been consistent. Consistent with, with, with locking in with the dog, start reading, doing my research on them. And I start, you know, coming across more mentors and they start teaching me more and more what I need to know about these dogs. Stay in the right. game. Sir. All right. That's what's up. That's what's up. All right. Got a question for uh, Mr. Garcia. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and start it off. Uh, you are the, uh, the, the um, only person on the panel who has uh, successfully bred some dogs. So we're going to ask you, uh, what is, you know, if you have an option, um, uh, because there's always a debate. I think we talked about this prior. There's always a debate about breeding for mouth versus breeding for gameness. Now, I'm sure everybody would prefer to have both, but um, how do you breed for, um, if let's say you, you, you know, hopefully we all got game dogs. But how do you increase mouth in a dog? How how do you breed for that, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the the easiest way is to breed to dogs or bloodlines that have it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second way would be basically, you know, uh, through an outcross, because that produces hybrid vigor, and generally mouth comes along with that. Sometimes it don't, but but it does. But if you breed to dogs specifically uh, that come from bloodlines that retain it like like uh eli bully son eli jr jocko even lonzo dogs you know zebo dogs then then that's probably the easiest way to to introduce or increase the mouth in your dog yeah. mm -hmm. uh, or, or 
any any family that's that's known for that, you know, whether it's something that has those ones I mentioned in it, you know, and and a person like for example Kenny Gaines. That, that's all he cared about was mouth. He wasn't really interested in in gameness and all that. Not that he didn't appreciate or didn't have game dogs, but he focused on mouth. And he used to say, you know, back then, if, if you can hang with me for thirty minutes, you're probably going to win. But you <coughs> hell hanging with me for thirty minutes. Right, and his right. dogs were, were known for being very hard on dogs, you know. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a trend. That's like a trend I noticed uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, I guess you could say the last, really the last 20 some years uh, it's, has been, um, or even before that, there's been a lot of people breeding f- uh, to have a short night, you know, go right. in there, go in there and be very explosive. Dis- destruction, total destruction immediately. Get the fuck out of here. Like, you know what I'm saying? You yeah. Know? So, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it, it goes in, in kind of waves, you know, or ge- it's generational, you know, and it's the same thing with game foul. They, they've done the same thing back in the seventies, you know, uh, they did that with game foul. They wanted hard hitting birds. They really weren't concentrating on gameness, you know, and same thing with dogs, you know, it, I would say that with the introduction of the Eli dogs or bully son dogs, Eli junior dogs, you know, that they, they kind of went that direction. And then what happens, you know, the pendulum swings too far to one side and then they start losing gameness. And then, and then, you know, you gotta, you gotta go back to the game part of it, you know, but it, it has that where it, you know, people, people do that, right? concentrate on it. And when you do that, you know, too much, you, you, you lose other stuff, you know, and then you have to you have to go back and and uh, and get back on track. But it's a it's a kind of a trendy thing, like you're saying, you know. And uh, right, right. You know, if you think of it from a competitor's point of view, you know, it's hard to be in there for a long time because you know you're jumping around, moving around, scraping your knees, and you're sweating even in freezing weather, and it, it taxes you, you know, it plays on your emotions. It's, 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 you know, on your health, you know, all that stuff. Right. Right. So, you know, that's, those are one of the reasons why people, they just like to get in there and get out. Everybody does, you know, nobody, anybody says they wouldn't, you know, is lying, but, but, you know, there's times when you're just in that position where you can be there for a while, two, three hours sometimes, you know? Right. So you're gonna have to have a dog that that can do that, you know. And absolutely. Uh, you know, I never understood that about the game file. It's like um, when you have a you might have a bird that's that has this great pedigree and all of that, you know, and then with one swipe of some big ass fucking spear is over for him. You know what I mean? It, yeah. I just, I never understood. It's just like a waste to me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's kind of the. And, you know, they, they're real fast and you have to really be a student and you have to know what you're looking at to see it because it's yeah. all of a sudden, bam, you know, one's laid out. What happened? But right. with experience, you know, and all that, you can see it. But that that comes along with the with the short knives, you know. We used to call them Mexican short knives. I'm good, but thanks. Uh, and and with gas, it's different. Those are, those are longer ones. You see more gameness in that, you know. Mm-hmm. Those were more popular back in the day. But the Mexicans have always been fans of the short knife. And, uh, you know, it's just one blade, one curved blade. And they can end on the first fly. Boom, it's over. Right. Or they can go some time, too. It depends. You right. Know? And that I think what you're mentioning, that's what people, that's why they're not interested, you know. It's like, right. well, it's, you don't really get to see a lot. The bird don't show too much. It's just more like whoever gets there first and it's done. You know? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why. That's what I always. Uh, I mean, you know, that's what I always. You know, I saw some stuff before on YouTube. Mm-hmm. YouTube used to have these uh, these little game file um, contests on there. I think they still got them on YouTube too. Yeah, they're, but, they're uh, from Mexico or, or Philippines and stuff. You know. Right, right. Yeah, Philippines. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, over in over in like uh, twenty seconds. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah. You know like damn, this dude. You know what I mean? I'm sure he invested a lot of time and breeding and money into this, 
20 yeah. fucking seconds, man. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes less. Sometimes it's on the first hit. Boom. Right. You know. Sheesh. Uh, uh, you know. It, also, the, the, you know, the, the, Economics is is a lot less. Not not that they don't put a lot of money into it, you know, but you can breed a whole bunch of birds in a relatively short period of time, and the maintenance isn't that much. A little tie out, throw them some feed, you know, and and uh, I mean, there's a lot to it. The health and the the, the you know the confirmation, all that is important to them too, you know. Uh, right. Everything from the from the feathers to the wings to the legs. Head, neck, beak, all that is important when they do their breedings. But it's not like dogs where you got to wait two or three years, you know. Right. Within a few months, you you know, you got stags that you can raise. Oh build. yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah, okay. So the the turnaround is 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 uh probably faster. better. Yeah, faster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, you know, birds birds hatch in twenty one days. You know, that too, and then so. You know, after 21 days, you got a whole bunch of birds, and within you know nine months, they're already hitting the show ring. You know, right, right. Now, salute to the chat, much love. I see you in here, Supreme Beast Boss Talk, Tay Tay. We love the Tay Tay. I see you in here. What's up, Bert? Mirror in the building. Uh, we got a question here. Uh, says, uh, can I keep my son and dad? I guess he's talking about his dogs. Can he keep the father and son together, or the daughter? And the dad together. I I think you should just get you another kennel, bro. Get you a kennel, keep them separated. Uh, otherwise, you're just gonna be mad at yourself, man. You know? Yeah, yeah. The thing with with dogs, especially this breed, you know, you everybody's seen where they they can be together and this and that. And some are even raised with cats and this and that. It's it's all up to the dog. You can't force them. You can't make them. People think they can train that into them. It's bullshit. You can't. If the dog allows it or is, is it's okay being with, with other animals, then that's on the dog. But even then, even people I know that, that do that, you know, you always got to keep your eye on them. You can't leave them alone. You got to have a, a stern voice and all that stuff. And, and they have to, the dog has to have the right temperament, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's basically just having them together when, 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 you know, from, from, the time they're born, you know, the, the 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 son is around the father and the father accepts it, it'd be okay. But you always got to keep an eye on because that can change. The son can mature and turn on and then turn on his dad or the dad can see that the son is maturing. And, uh, you know, now the son becomes a challenge or there's a confrontation. Then all that changes in the in the blink of an eye from one day to the next, from one second to the next. Mm -hmm. my, my advice for everyone is always keep them separated you know I, I, I like I said you have you have some that can do that and it takes an experienced eye and experienced hand to have them that way you, you can't uh, you can't yeah. just, just like I said you can't train it into them man. that's the mistake that, that we used to make a joke you know these these people that non dog fighter guys they have more fights than we do because they allow their dogs to stay together and then one day they turn on and they bang each other up you know yeah, yeah they're they all in the fights you know right yeah they go to they, they they get these dogs from the from a rescue yeah and, you know and then they you know they got four dogs in the house they leave them in the house and they go to work for 8 hours and shit and come back and oh this pit bull he, he just he, he, right he killed my doberman and all this dumb shit yeah mm -hmm. exactly you know, take responsible ownership. Like I mentioned in the other chat, you know, it's these ain't regular dogs. You know, they're like a thoroughbred horse. You can't, you can't, you can't treat them like a pet, even though they may be a pet. They may be, you know, part of the family and all that. Their mentality is different. You know, there's there's race horses. They'll bite you. They'll kick you. They'll step on you. They got a lot of spirit, man, and they have a lot of. There's different temperaments to them. You know? Right. And, right. Dogs are the same way. It's not a it's not a regular dog, you know. You can't you can't make them behave. It's just a matter of if they want to or not, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what you say? What you think about that, Blitz? What was the question again, Boss Man? About about uh, keeping uh, dogs together. As far as the guy asked the question, can he keep his can he keep the 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 son with with his father or the daughter with his father? 
if, I feel like if we talking about the American pit bull terrier, then no. But if you talking about like Frenchies or you feel me, depending on what dog he got, I I don't deal with other dogs, so I can't really give you that. You know, no, he's talking about pit bulls. Okay, mm -hmm. um, no, I wouldn't do it. That's just you feel me. Even I've seen dogs playing around too rough and it gets serious. You know, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, it'll escalate. It's definitely anything peeing in the same spot to escalate into something something mm -hmm. wild. I've seen it all. Like, yeah, yeah. getting possessive. I've seen. <coughs> I had I had these two dogs. This is when I was younger. You know, I didn't. I was didn't really. I mean, I knew better, but I thought I could do. I thought I could fucking break the rules and shit. So, I got this dog. It's a new a new male. I already had male at home, but I brought this new male there. I couldn't pass him up. Beautiful fucking dog. Big, monstrous, you know what I mean? I bring him home. I put him in the backyard, and I kind of introduce him to my other male, look, like, slowly and stuff. And, you know, they were sketchy with each other at first, but, you know, it was like this weird little tension, but they didn't they didn't fight or nothing. And uh, one day a cat, a cat ran into the garage, and they chased it in there. They fucking wrecked the cat, and then after that, when, once the cat was dead, they just they looked at each other and said, "Oh, who the fuck are you?" You know, bam. You know what I'm saying? And it was over. So I said, "Oh, well, that experiment didn't last long. Didn't yeah. last long." Salute to Mr. J Dub Twenty Texas, man. Salute to you, bro. I got your email too, fam. Appreciate you in that super chat. Uh, salute to Doug in the super chat. Much love, much appreciation. Says salute to all the dog men new to the channel. Thank you, brother. Thank you for being here. Salute to you. All right. Let's see here. All right. Let me get to another question here. We got um how all right, let's talk about breeding, breeding out bad traits or starting over. Okay. At what point should you start over? Okay. This is a question I think we talked about in the past. Somebody asked it recently. They want they wanted your thoughts on it. Uh it was on one of the shows that you weren't here. But breed at one point. Do you if you start seeing bad traits on your yard, at what point do you start over or uh do you continue to try to breed those traits out? Right. The uh you know, there's always something what do you want to say negative or bad in your dogs. They're never perfect. You know, sometimes you get individuals that are perfect, you know, within your family. And and uh, you know, that happens and it's great. But there's always something, you know, wrong with it or something you don't like. When, when those negatives become, whether it's temperament, behavior, you know, confirmation, uh, athleticism or lack of it, you know, when they become more dominant than the good stuff, that's the time to start over. Look for something else. You know, before it gets to that point, you, the only way to do it is the, the dogs that, that retain those bad traits or have them and pass them on. Get rid of them. Don't use them. When I say get rid of them or I say call, it doesn't mean kill them, you know, but, right. but it means it means don't don't include them in your in your breeding program. You may you may use them for something. Else. You may use them for confirmation or you may use them for hog hunting or you may use them for weight full this and that. But I wouldn't breed them. So when the bad out starts becoming too prevalent, you know. Because it's just like a good producer, you know, they'll consistently throw their good traits, strength, speed, air, all that, you know. Right. And and some dogs consistently throw bad traits. You just can't get rid of them, you know, and they're right. stuck in there. And the more you breed them, the, the, the more it increases. Absolutely. So in the first like place. Like click dog. When click dogs it, do that shit. Yeah. Right. So the first place, you know, if they have something you don't like, I don't care if it's a crooked tail or six toes or floppy ears, whatever it is you don't like. And this sounds kind of silly, but, you know, it's extreme. But I'm just using that example because everybody talk about game, this game, this game. Yeah, OK, we got it. That, that you know, that, that's what the breed's about. But when you get down to fine tuning your blood, anything you don't like, maybe too thin bone, too thin skin, they break their teeth real easy. You know, quirky mental shit. They're too destructive or, or you know, they, they, they lazy, whatever it is. If you don't like it, don't breed them. You know, right. that's the best way to do it. 
and you know, I get flack for that all the time. Well, he's he's good at that. I understand. I had a lot of dogs. That's not a lot, but several that I competed with. They were good enough to win and compete with, but they weren't good enough for breeding purposes. Right. Because they had certain things I didn't like. You know, one scratched too slow, and he was kind of funky attitude. Other ones they were they were too thin boned, and they you know sometimes they wouldn't scratch, and then just just they couldn't take punishment. They weren't durable. You know, and that's a big part of my breeding program is, is durability in the dog. So right. I use them, you know, and but it, I wouldn't breed them. I didn't breed them, you know. If I did, then the breeding proved out the same, and I got rid of all those. And I, I got rid of everything, man. Anything related to that stuff that had it, that, that I dumped it, you know. It's just, that, right. that, that was just me. And it seems like, you know, it's a lot and wow, and you invest money in this and that. Well, shit, if you ain't willing to do what it takes to have good dogs, don't get involved in it. Right, right. Because it's you're gonna lose money, you're gonna lose dogs, you're gonna all this and that's gonna happen. But if you know how to breed, once you learn how to breed and you know how to get what you want, all that shit that you had to go through, it pays off. And you start increasing your percentages and you start having more good dogs and bad dogs than bad dogs. And and you know, you get to a point where you're doing good. You know? Absolutely. You know, hey. Salute to the brother Ram and Thompson in the building. What's up, Ram? What's happening, man? Shit. I'm sorry, just got on from work. Yes, indeed. What's good, What's Ram? Good, Mr. Thompson. What's happening? How y'all doing today? Good. 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 What's we going on, Thompson? Born some pistons or something, you know, or <laughs> having a supercharger or something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's just what I got done doing, though, installing a supercharger on a slow ass Camaro. Hey, hey yo, Ram, I just, I, I just, I bought a damn. Uh, sorry to get off topic, but I, I bought a, a, a 2008 Hemi Charger. I had that motherfucker for two weeks in an engine without him. Where can I find a, a Hemi engine for a 2008 Hemi Charger? Go to the, go to the junkyard and pull one. And if you pull it, you might as well go on and get it bored out. So if you can find like a SRT that's crashed and go on and pull that out, it shouldn't be no more than like three thousand bucks, bro. Okay, now I was already thinking that anyway. Yeah, hell yeah, that's what I did. I got a four twenty six on building. I pulled it out of three ninety two, went and got it bored and shit. You know? Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, it was only twenty five hundred dollars because I pulled it myself. So yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know what the fuck y'all talking about. I'm just listening. You know? uh, yeah, yeah, car yeah. shit, boring yeah. shit, man. Let's get back to these dogs and bro. Yeah, I just, I just drive cars, man. I don't know nothing about fixing. But, uh, I'm just, they're, they're, talking, talking. they're talking about the pit bull engines of the, of the car world, you know. Kind of, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ram, 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 Ram be doing his thing with the engines, though. He knows exactly what he's doing with them. What's up, Thompson? Thompson, can you hear me? <laughs> We're going on. Salute to the panel, yo. Salute, salute. Well, yeah, I gave you salute, man. Yes, indeed, man. How everything going over there, man? You got everything set up good? I've been to process everything. You know, you got to take this shit one day at a time. Right, right, right. Yes, indeed, man. All right, so let me get to one of the questions here that y'all uh, missed out on. And which was uh? Hey, is my uh, shit clear? Is, is my shit clear? Or is it fucked up? No, it, it's clear, but it's like a lag. It's a lag. Like you, like uh, like you probably getting my question like two seconds behind or something. Let's see here. Let me go to the questions here. Yeah, I'm gonna hold my shit up to the North Star. I'm out here in the boondocks and shit. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we talking. We just talked about. Breathing, breathing out uh, bad traits. Uh, and uh, me and Ram, I think we talked about this. I think we talked about this on another show before. But uh, at what point uh, do you start over completely? You know? Hey, Blitz, I'm going to put you on mute real quick. At what point do you start over completely uh, when you notice your yard has bad Let's just say you, you have bad breeding practices or whatever the case may be. You just went, went with something too long, and now you got – you know, a, a yard full of bullshit. And you're trying to get that shit off, you know, you're trying to... At what point do you say, forget it, I'm starting over with some new dogs, some new blood, or uh, do you continue to try to uh, improve the, the blood, like outcrossing and shit like that? Ram, go ahead. 
Man, if I lose one competition to a motherfucker I know I could beat with one arm, everything got to go. Because I've been <laughs> fucking up, man, for real. If I'm getting my ass whooped by somebody who I know I'm supposed to be molly whopping, mm-mm, that ain't going to work, bro, you know? Plus, like uh, Mr. Garcia was saying, like, I'm so picky, bro. Like, one bad move. You can make one bad move and the rest could be a 10 on your fucking scorecard. I'm, you got to go, homie. <laughs> you know? Right. That's why I don't got a bunch of dogs and haven't had a bunch of them, though. Because, you know, I practice those hard culling processes. And that's just the way you got to be if you want to compete at a high level, man. You can't care if you love the blood, <laughs> your grandpa gave it to you, whatever. <laughs> the shit is sucking. Get that shit out of here, man. Hey, no. Ram, hey, Ram be keeping it real, man. Hey, Ram said, you know, Ram told me he had me dying laughing. He said, man, I can spot a cur as soon as he got the truck. <laughs> <laughs> the hell? Because I had so many curs, bro. Just on the come up, I had so many curs. I know what a cur look like as soon as I see him. As soon as you put the collar on him, he said, quit. <laughs> oh, shit. Man. And that dude. motherfucker packs it up. <laughs> man, I'll be so mad if I pull up to a contest and somebody say, "Yeah, he's that's a curry right there." I'll be pissed the fuck off. <laughs> 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 like God, oh, yeah, he got about an hour in him. He gonna jump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fucked up, man. Yeah, but that, uh, that's true. You know, if you if you have enough of them and you spend enough time seeing a bunch of them. They show you stuff that maybe someone else might not see, you know, and and every once in a while they might fool you, but most of the time you're gonna be right, just because yeah, of that. Hell yeah! yeah. And with that knowledge, though, you could you know have a gambler's delight type of dog too, yeah. you know, because you know he fucking squarely, surely, goddamn acting like cap dogs, but you know they gonna come still. Yeah. You could trick a motherfucker, you oh, know yeah, who's yeah, sitting yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it got it. It got his perks and his minuses, you know, fucking with the curves. But yeah, I had a whole lot of curves. So I, I know yeah. when them motherfuckers is finna cur out. <laughs> yeah. I'm just yeah. picturing some dude getting out of his truck with his dog. He think he got a bulldog and Ram just like, no, that's a curve, man. <laughs> right, don't bet too much money on that dog, man. You go quit. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Hey, uh, let me get that question to Thompson. At one point, uh, Thompson, at what point on your yard, let's say you had did some bad breeding practice or something, and uh, you know, you at what point would you say, you know, I got I'm gonna keep trying to improve this bloodline by outcrossing, or would you just fuck it? I'm starting over. At what point what does it take for you to start over? You on mute, Thompson. Oh shit. Yeah, I see a lot of shit that I don't like, you know. When I, I like I said, around that three year mark, I'm making harsh assessments. If I don't like what I see, I I, I just get rid of it. You know, it moves on. You know, that, y'all think y'all was talking about? I caught parts of what y'all was saying when I was walking around the yard. It's like that mouth thing. Some people will chase mouth and be like, "Cause the dog has mouth," and you got a bunch of other traits that are not desirable in the dog. You know, some people will breed that. You know what I mean? I game this first, but there's a lot of things that I equate that I want to see in them dogs. And if it's just one thing and the bad outweighs the good, you know, I don't believe it's breeding quality, but that's just my perspective, my perspective on the shit. Cause ain't nobody got years to be wasting and money to be wasting, praying and hoping on something to be something that it hasn't had a legacy of being. You get what I'm saying? People expect greatness from shit. That's not great to begin with. You know, that's that diamond in the rough shit. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know. Okay. Um, what do you guys think about? Let me start with you, uh, Mr. Garcia. What's your thoughts on <clears throat> this question came in on Instagram about adding wind? Somebody wants to want to know they want to add wind uh, to to their program. Said he got some good game dogs. He like everything about him except for uh, he can't for some reason he can't improve their wind. Uh, should, you know, if he looking to outcross or what? What can he do? Is it something he can do personally, or does he need to uh, find something else with some wind? Well, there, there's, you know, honestly, most dogs have good air. Mm-hmm. The, the problem with a lot of them, like, uh, and I ain't picking on nobody, and I'll even put the blood. I use Jeep dogs, you know, Zebo dogs, stuff like that, is 
they get, they get excited and they blow their self out. They don't know how to pace their self. And speaking mm-hmm. about, speaking about engines, you know, I kind of relate this to, to, in conditioning to the dogs, you know, when you step on the gas, the RPMs go up 3,000, 4,000, whatever it is, six, up to 6,000. And, and you see the needle move up. You're still pressing on the gas. And when you get up to speed, the needle drops down 1,800, 2,000, whatever it is. That's kind of way the, the heart and the breathing of a dog is supposed to work. They're moving fast. They're, they're doing their work. They're this and that but they're controlling their heart rate. They're controlling their breathing. And dogs that get overexcited and can't pace themselves, no matter what bloodline it is, they're gonna lose their air, you know? And, right. and, and But some some bloodline like Bolio dogs, you know, they're known for having good air. They just naturally pace themselves. Even when they're moving fast, they control their breathing and their, and their, and their uh, heart rate, right? So, so there's, dogs particular dogs or certain bloodlines that you can breed to or like you said maybe maybe throw an outcross in there where you can you can have individuals that come out of that that, that learn how to pace themselves and control their their breathing the other thing this is prevalent in, in pit bulls some of them have a cleft palate or a, you know it's in their throat where, where it's supposed to be the throat's supposed to be circular and they'll have flaps of skin on the side and it's kind of pear-shaped or diamond shape mm-hmm. and that 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 just takes a little surgery to cut that loose skin that flop of skin that's out of there and their passageway becomes clear but for the most part most dogs they have good air anyway some some you know they can move at a faster pace and it don't affect them some they, they slow down their pace a little bit to, to help with their breathing and and uh, you know it's like anything else you know Find something that, that's known for that, either a family of dogs or a particular dog. Throw it into your blood and, and see if it improves your win. But overall, just because of the history of breeding, so many of them used for competition and this and that for almost 200 years, they have to have good air. You know, right. and, and most of the ones that don't is because they get overexcited, man. They blow themselves out and they can't recoup. Every dog runs hot, like we say. I, I call it breaking their wind. Right. But when 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 a dog runs hot, most of the time they don't recoup from it. They're, they're, they're played out. But those that can can break their wind and recoup on the fly as they're moving, you know, those, those are the best types. And then you have that second wind, third wind, whatever it takes over a period of time. But that that's my take on it. You know, uh, right. it, it, it's it's. In a particular dog, if he don't have air, he just don't have it. There's not really anything you do. You can do some conditioning; it might help it a little bit, you know. But to increase it exponentially, where where it's just, you know, like night and day, nah, it, it don't happen. You know? Okay. Yeah, I mean that's just kind of like humans too. Like you can have a guy that's he could be in shape, he can be in good shape and shit. You know what I'm saying? But if if somebody run up to him, you know what I mean, uh, on the streets and just you know fire off on him, and he, he, now he in the middle of a fight, his adrenaline, and he get all excited and shit, he gonna be fucking tired in 30 seconds. <sighs> because, he, you know, he not a trained fighter, don't know how to pace himself and shit, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, now, some of those are good, you know, and that's what people look for in the, in the short run. They just want to blow them out. And right. if you can keep up that pace with them for 30 minutes, they're gonna take you out if they have the tools to do so. You know? That, right. that's, that, you know, it's always, you know, one, one or the other sometimes, you know, and, 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 you know, people bank on that, you know, like I was talking about Kenny Gaines. He used to say, if you, you can last 30 minutes with me, you're probably going to beat me, but you play hell doing it, you know, mm-hmm. and that, that was just, that was, you know, he was more of the gamma type. He bred a lot of good dogs, but that was just his mentality. And I respect him for that, you know, because he knew what he had, he knew what he was working with and he won a lot more than he lost, you know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Uh, Ram, what, what's your thoughts on it, bro? Hey, Kitty did used to say that though. He like, man, you got thirty minutes, you got a motherfucker, <laughs> but it's gonna be a motherfucker getting to that thirty minutes with that turtle buster shit. Yeah. Uh, like Mister Garcia was saying, man, some dogs you can do it with, some you can't. Uh, sometimes it's genetic. Like some dogs might have, you know, too thick, dense muscle, and 
you know, that thick ass muscle cause that lactic acid buildup because it takes so much oxygen to fuel it. So, you know, uh, I had a couple Zebo dogs that was like that, like built like tanks. And, you know, they was them 30 minute motherfuckers for real. Sometimes you can breed it out of it. Sometimes it just is what it is. Uh, you can condition. You can be a great conditioner and only just increase his win a 5% bump, you know. You just, I don't know. These dogs is weird, bro. There's some shit you can do and some shit you can't do with them. If uh, you having like a, the problem is, you know, in your breeding to where you got, you know, like I was saying, those short, squatty, thick, dense, muscly dogs, you could fix that with breeding the rangier dogs, you know less dense muscle type shit, but uh, I don't know, man. That's a tricky question, you know, without being able to physically see his dogs and see, you know, yeah, I know what his got, version know, of I running know. out of gas is compared to what my version is, I, you know? Right, right. I know he said he got Eli dogs, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah, so, yeah. But yeah, sometimes they just get too excited like the Eli dogs, they turn up like a Red Boy dog on you, bro. It just be fucking 100 miles an hour on the chain, just wasting all the good energy that them big motherfuckers would need, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Blind with, with rage, if you want to say, you know, it's like... Exactly. Like, the motherfuckers hard. damn near in a coma, screaming in the corner and foaming exactly. and shit. <laughs> exactly. It, it, uh, them, the, for me, them kind of dog, you really don't want to travel with because they, they'll blow, the, you know, they'll burn their chef out just on the Trip, you know, they yeah, they be burnt out walking to the car, you know, <laughs> just in the truck. Sick back, you know, they they just <laughs> you know, it, it just it's individual, too. You know, you got to take each dog on its own and all that, but there's there's certain things in a family of dogs that you that you notice, you know, and like you were saying earlier, you kind of want to breed it out if you can, if you can't cut your losses early and and don't, you know. And and the thing with breeding, you mess you mentioned outcross. You know, mo most people wait till they see something bad to outcross, right? And I, I, I'm lacking this or I need that. For me, I, I outcross whenever I saw something I like. I didn't mm -hmm. wait for things to go south, and I would just include it in my blood so it's there, you know, already. And right. and uh, if it's an outside male, you know, I had to see him with my own two eyes before I right. breed to him. Regardless of pedigree, regardless of who had it, if I didn't see it, I was very reluctant to breed to it based on even what the breeder told me or, or other people said about it, you know, and I got, I kind of got that idea from Boyle. That's what he told me when I, you know, he bred the Cherokee Chief and he bred the Oiler Junior and all them, dog, you know, the bumper champion bumper. He saw him go, you know, so I kind of, that stuck with me. So if I bred to a, a, an outside dog, you know, it, it was something I saw myself, so I could make a fair judgment in my own mind. You know, right, right, okay. Uh, what you say, uh, Thompson, about um, uh, uh, how can he improve his dog's win? Oh uh, shit! Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, shit. Um, oh, okay. I caught a little bit of it. What was it? The wind? Okay. Yeah, yeah. How can he? How can this guy improve his dog's wind? You know, you know. You want to add some, uh, I guess, conditioning. Yeah. Well, shit. I agree with what the panel mostly said. You know, that's one of those traits where I always seen it. Like either you got it or you don't. You know what I mean? I like those dogs that's a rangy with the elongated rib cage with the big barrel lungs and stuff. I like the that that phenotype of having win, you know what I mean? And I'll implicate those type of dogs. Cause like Ram said, you know, I got some short, stockier ones. And they got fair win, but you know, I think a lot of that is kind of based on structure and build. Now, you know, it's still an individual aspect, like Mr. Garcia said. But at the same time, you know, it's one of those traits, either you got it or you don't. And if you don't, like Ram said, you can do conditioning, a lot of a lot of swimming, a lot of nice hand walking, you know what I mean? And you could probably bump it up 5%, 10%, but it's it's really a trait. And I think the physical goes hand in hand with that trait, you know what I mean? You get two heavy, dense bone dogs, you know, it's almost from the historical standpoint, 
point, you know, styles make fights. You know what I mean? Heavyweights ain't like featherweights and welterweights, you know. It's different styles with different structures on some of these dogs. So, you know, if he has some, you could try to do a lot of hand walking, a lot of swimming, try to bust it up a little bit, boost it up about 5%, 10%. But either you got it or you don't when it comes to that type of thing with me. Can you teach a dog to pace themselves? Because uh, I know that's, a, you know, some people who have been very successful, too. Some people put their dogs on, uh, when they condition their dog, they condition them on automatic treadmills. You know what I mean? And, so, and others feel like an automatic treadmill is not teaching the dog to pace itself and, and recover. So they like to let the dog uh, move on its own. But what's your thoughts on that, Mr. Garcia? Blitz, I, I ain't forget about you. I just don't want, you know what I'm saying? I know you, you're a young bulldog, man, so I'm sure you're just sucking it up. You know what I mean? But go ahead. What you think, Mr. Garcia? Yeah, no, no. In my respect, yeah, I, I could, you know, Teach is a, is a fun, funny word, you know, because you get, you know, it, it's more they learn. You don't you don't really teach them, you know. They they have it in them to do it or not. But yeah, I used to used to be able to to teach my dogs because of the blood. Them jeep dogs, they just they cycle, you know. Right. And you have to you have to uh, get them to the point where where they can be trying to go balls out and you hold back on them. And over a period of time, you know. You can you, you they'll understand that that I'm I'm gonna push hard, but I can't push as hard as I want because I ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. You know I'm stuck here. So so in that respect, that's how I kind of taught my dogs to to pace theirself. You know, and and uh, you know it worked. On some it don't work. They just nutty and crazy, and they ain't gonna learn no matter what. But some of them they can kind of get the idea. Okay, I I can pull hard. Or I can work hard, but you know, not as hard as I'd really like because there's something holding me back. And it was usually me. I just hold back on the lead, and they'd be pulling up, you know, as hard as they could, but they ain't moving that fast. And over over distance, they'll they'll settle down, still pull, but not as hard as they were. And if I wanted to increase that pace, then I would just, you know, loosen up on the lead and let them let them pull, and then I, you know. Do that over and over. Let them go when 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 it got too much, and, and pull back when it wasn't enough. You know. Right. So there's certain things you can introduce to them, and they'll they'll go along with it. Just you know, that's kind of uh, if you want to say subconsciously, you know. And and you're just you're you're uh, you know kind of like Pavlov's dog. You're teaching. They ain't really understanding what you're doing, but they go along with it because of how you know. It's kind of like uh, you take a, you can take a horse out and you can ride them a certain way, right? And you get to this point, you gallop them. Then after, you know, 100 yards or whatever, you can hold back and get them to trot then get them to walk. You do that same distance, that same routine with a horse over and over, pretty soon you don't have to do nothing. You don't even have to hold the reins. They'll go through that same routine the same. They get to that point, they'll start galloping on their own. And then they'll they'll start trotting and back off and walk and then they'll do it over and over back and forth like that. So you're kind of mentally conditioning the dog to do that, you know. At, right, at right. certain point, he's going to slow down a little bit, and then when when he has an advantage, he's going to pick up the pace, you know, kind of like that. Okay. <clears throat> what you say, Ram? You ever can can you teach a dog uh, to pace? You ever pace taught a dog to pace himself? Yeah, hell yeah, you can, bro. You know, like uh, Mr. Garcia was saying, though, some dogs just won't get it. Some don't give a fuck. They just like, man, I'm turbocharged. What the fuck? You got me in traffic. I'm trying to go. But uh, some dogs, yeah, you can. And I used to do kind of like what he was saying with the horses on the slap mill, you know, get them going, 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 you know, building it up and, you know, slow it down, break the stride, calm them down, you know, talk to them smooth like I would a broad, you know, smooth them on out. Then hype them back up, you know, a couple minutes later when the timer go off. And right. after a while, I could put him on the, the slap mill and he would run that exact routine. But, you know, he was a smart dog and all that good old shit that go with it. Like, but he had a brother that fucking couldn't get right at all. <laughs> he just want to burn the mill down, you know. And I never got to compete with him because, you know, he, he 
can be in shape how I want him to enough to where, you know, he could do what he's doing all night. He was just a balls out type of dog. And I was like, mm -hmm. nah, I ain't giving up no free money because he going to shoot his wide as soon as he stick the tip in, you right, know? No right. doubt. <clears throat> what you exactly. say, Thompson? I think a lot of that's based off of what Ram and uh, Mr. Garcia, the dog has to possess a certain level of intelligence. You know, we, you know, we got to talk about brains and smarts when it comes to that kind of shit. Because if you got one that's just full bloated, blown and he, that's just what he is. He has to possess a certain amount of intelligence to pace himself. It's very few manipulating you can do without a dog, without that level of intelligence. And some of them don't possess it. That, that's just the honest part of it. You know, they, they are cut from that cloth and they always going to be from that cloth. You, because even if you're getting that full repetition when you're working the dog, you change the environment or the situation, all that shit's out the window. You know what I mean? It's all good if you and him are working, but you change the scenery and then that dog goes ballistic. Like Ram said, you know, the dog has to be able to be trained and possess that knowledge and retain that knowledge of it. And that's when intelligence comes big into these dogs. Mm -hmm. Point. Exactly. I've had I've had one or two do that where, like you said, the environment changed this. Once they see that that building, all them people they go off and that all that training go out the window, man. They go crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Salute to Armed Forces Sports. Excuse me. Salute to Armed Forces in the super chat. Much love, much appreciation, man. He says, I don't know much about dogs because the cop let one bite me in my inner thigh. <laughs> he says, just miss my jewels. He says, but my therapist said to watch this show is killing my fear. That's good. That's good. See, I'm glad we can help the world out here today. We can help we can help the world out here today, man. Salute to Armed Forces. Uh, uh, pit bulls and mental health bringing people closer one scratch at a time. God damn it. <laughs> That's right. That's a good t shirt right there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's up? I am ill. Will, I see you in the building, bro. Okay. Uh, this is another question. Um, now, this is uh, a question I have because uh, I've had several conversations with people. Uh, over the last few months, and uh, different dog men, and they, they, they all, uh, some, some of them have the idea of not getting their dogs registered. Um, I want your opinion on this. Um, some breeders are, are saying, "Look, these are my dogs. I know what I got. I'm not selling my dogs. I'm not registering them because I don't want these people in my fucking business." You know, you sell your dog, and you know, motherfucker get registered. Next thing you know. You know, something happened with this guy. Your name is on this and that. This then the fucking police and everybody come fucking with you, and you ain't got nothing to do with nothing. You know. So I mean, how you, I want y'all opinion on that. Uh, if it's, I mean, does it even matter if it's your dog? You're not selling them. Does it even fucking matter if you register? You know what I mean? What's your, what's your take on that, Mister Garcia? Well, that that's true, especially in today's atmosphere. You know, and I own a registry, right? But but mine's real private. There's no link up between any information of who owns a dog and who bred the dog, all that, you know, they, they, right. I strictly register on numbers, you know, you right. can't, for instance, you can't, you can't go in my computer and look up, you know, schoolboys this and that. It's not going to show up. It's strictly by the number and any personal information. I don't keep it. Right. Even in my own files, you know, not on the computer anyways, you know, but, but, in today's atmosphere, you know, you got to be careful because like we were talking the last time, anything can, can, can come and mess with you, you know. You should keep records of your own breedings just for your own self because in 10 or 20 years, if you still have dog, you ain't going to remember how they were bred in the past. And that's the whole point of the registry, you know. It's, it's to keep the history and the family of dogs and the, and the breedings and all that correct even though there's a lot of shyster shit and, and fake pets and all that stuff, you know, it's up to the integrity of the person if they're going to keep accurate records. But that's the important of it, importance of it, you know, and the importance of a registry is to keep those, keep those breedings for the future, you know, and something you can look on in the past and see how dogs were put together 
you know, which ones were bred, how many times and all that stuff. But, but you got to be real careful in today's times. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, you know, the old timers, they, they never told you shit man. they didn't, you know, it was an insult if you asked them how their dogs were bred because they jump all over your ass, you know, because it ain't nobody's business as far as that goes, you know, and, and, uh, you know, sometimes people put too much emphasis on pedigrees, you know, and the, the emphasis was never on the pedigree. It was always on the dog. So if the dog's worthy and you breed it and it produces and you continue with it, you should have a record of it. But other than that, more so nowadays, most people keep their own records, you know, and some people I know they keep them separate. They keep it somewhere else. You know, they don't have any information. They don't even keep paraphernalia in their house or memorabilia, none of that stuff, you know. So you just got to be ever mindful of that and be careful who you talk to and who you let them, you know, if, you know, me, because I'm old school, if I was going to get dogs nowadays, I just go to somebody I know that has them, that, that I know what they do with them. And, 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 you know, I wouldn't care how it's bred. The dog came from my friend and he breeds good dogs. And that's all I give a shit about. If it works out, he'll, if he, and if he wants to, he'll tell me how it's bred. I don't, that, that is not important to me so much today. Like it was in the past, you know, even in the past, you know, it was a good dog I, they'll tell me what it is you know and and you know how it's bred and i keep a record of it but you just got to be careful today with all that shit right what anybody else think what you say man shit i agree i remember on the come up you know i wouldn't know how a bad dog was bred and if you didn't know the owner of the good dog you wouldn't know how he was bred you just know he was a good dog and you'd be breaking your fucking back trying to breed to the dog you know Find out how it's bred later. You just want a dog like that. Plus, I've never been big on registering my dogs. Like, I always tell the story. When I sold old dog, I had to tell dude, hold on, from sending the rest of the money because I didn't have his papers in. You know, like, he was a badass dog. Motherfucker paid a nice chunk of change for that dog, you know? <laughs> but it was just my own personal use. I knew how he was bred and all that. And uh, when I did breed them, you know, the pups I kept, I wouldn't register. But if you was going to get a pup from me, you know, I register pup A, pup B. And you could keep that or send it in, whatever the fuck you want to do after that. But that's for your own personal record, you know. So if you move forward with it, you know, this is the base where it started from, at least one of the cornerstones of your program. But other than that, man, I don't fucking register my dogs for that same I don't want nobody knowing what the fuck I got. If I'm competing with it, like, I won't even let you look under the hood of my car if we about to race. You better go have a nice dick meat sandwich and get to the line. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. That's just, that's just what it is. I mean, but if you're selling dogs, yeah, you need that. It's important. But if you competing, you know, not so much. Get done competing first. If that shit is even worth spending the money to register on. You know, so I'm used to I've registered whole litters before and whole litters fucking went to the curb pile. That was just money I wasted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people do that, too. They kind of like wait and see what they got before they even fucking send in the paperwork and shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I know. Guy, he he just puts one, two, three, you know, on the plus or ABC. And, and if they work out, then he gives them some badass name, you know. Right, right. <laughs> I right. don't have a name till it's three years old, you know. Right. And he call him Killer Kong or some shit, you know. Right. And, and uh, <laughs> make you think, wow, how's he picking all these good names for his dogs? Well, he ain't. You know, he ain't. He don't do it till, till they grow up. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 why I, I found that out when I I bought a puppy recently, and um, uh, the guy, you know, this is a reputable dog, man, and um, when I bought the puppy. He had to fucking uh, register the, the fucking father and shit. He had to register the father. And he's like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't need that shit. Everybody know who I am. He's like, but I said, yeah, I need my paperwork though, man. You know, shit, fuck that. I need my shit. I wanna, I'm still a nerd. I wanna look at my shit hanging on the wall or some shit. You know what I mean? I wanna know what yeah. the fuck I'm getting. But, but yeah, Thompson, what's your thoughts on it, bro? I'm 
many times you can hear me. Shit, that's an eye to beholder, man. You know, depends on. You can hear me? Yeah, bro, we hear you. Thompson, we hear you, bro. Hey, All right. Yeah, I said that's in the eye to beholder. That's in the, the eye to beholder to me, you know. I purchased dogs that I didn't transfer ownership over for years until I was getting ready to use them. You know what I mean? So it, it's all in the eye to behold. The, if you're a person who's in the fast lane and you're doing X, Y, and Z, you know, you need to be more cognizant of that. If you're a person who's breeding, you got to have that documentation. So, you know what I mean? As far as having the paperwork, and registering the dogs, you know, those are two different conversations. You can have the documentation and not register it. And there's a difference between not having it at all. You know what I mean? So it's kind of two different discussions. But at the same time, like I say, that's in the eye to behold it. If you're a person who's real private and you don't want any possibility of anybody ever knowing what's, what you got going on, uh, don't register it. But I would still say have your documentation. So when you if you ever have to or you want to refer like Ram and Mr. Garcia was saying, and you want to know how these dogs are bred for your recognition and your um, lineage purposes and knowing what you need to do moving forward, you know, it's important. But it's all different levels and different conversations when it comes to that. Yes, indeed. Yeah, good point. Like, like Thompson was saying, people get this kind of mixed up, too, is papers, you know, and pedigree. Papers mean registration. That, that, that's what that term means. Pedigree, a, a registered dog has a pedigree also, and, and a dog that's not registered, they have a pedigree. You know, and people kind of get that mixed up, you know. I don't know. I don't care about papers, but, but they care about the pedigree. Well, they're not the same thing in that respect. You know, one, one is one registering it with an entity, and the other is both should have a pedigree on it, you know. And, and I, I think know. people get it confused because the papers sometimes come with the pedigree on there and they right. associate the two. The papers are the pedigree. No, the pedigree make the papers. Like, right. just because you can see the pedigree on the papers does not make that fucking whatever piece of paper that pedigree is written on fucking nothing to yeah. supersede the dog. The dog will shit on that pedigree, eat it, and shit it back out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And my, mm -hmm. The dog can't read? None of that. If I fuck we had a dog that could read, we'd be on TV. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Always keep the dog first. Registering shit is important. Like I was saying, if you're selling dogs, yeah, of course. I'm not sending a fucking... Get you know high dollar for some shit that you know I can't fucking prove that at least on paper that is bred like that because that doesn't even guarantee the dog is bred like that. Maurice Carver gave you papers; they said exactly what the fuck they said on them. Did the dog's genetics say that that fucking paper matches his genetics? Who fucking knows? We still got good dogs, but going forward, you know, we still kind of breeding kind of crazy now because we don't know is it bred like this or is it bred like that. You're trying to breed it to each side of the family, but you still need those fucking papers, you know? Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. you don't need everybody to know about them is the whole debate. Like, you know, I register a litter of pups is going to be A, B, C, D. Like uh, Mr. Garcia was saying, I wait till a dog is fucking grown and he earned his name. And it's changed spot at my house before you even get a name. Other than that, your name is Dog. I mean, look, oh, Dog. That's what yeah. it's fucking. He was O on the registry. And he was a dog. His fucking <laughs> name is O Dog, bro. Hey. <laughs> it wasn't Doctor Minutes to Society or none of that shit. Nigga. Yeah. In the alphabetical order, you was O on the list, motherfucker. <laughs> right, right. You was a dog. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, I had, oh, this is another question came in the super chat. Salute to stand your ground, ten toes down in the super chat. What it do, fam? Salute to you. To schoolboy, what's up, OG? Does keeping a bulldog on a chain make him more aggressive than he would be if he stayed in the house? No, no. There, there, there's well, there's there's two 
you know, uh, train of thought, you know, and, and it's not really the aggressive part, but, but keep it on a chain. They act, they act more like a bulldog or a dog. Sometimes you bring them inside, it can kind of soften them up, mm -hmm. you know, but, but people think, you know, and that, this comes from the media mostly that putting them on a chain because they're confined that way makes them more aggressive, man aggressive, animal aggressive. That's not true. Right, right. That's not true. They actually have more freedom on a chain than they do in a kennel. That's facts. You know, anybody who's been incarcerated knows if you got four walls and a, you know, around you, you, you get that uneasy feeling. You claustrophobic, or you, you know, you can't go anywhere. You, there's no, you can see out the window, or you can see out your, the front, you know, the, the gate or whatever it is, you know. But you're confined, and and it can play on your mind. Whereas on a chain, you know, you have more freedom of movement. And they know they're they're tied up, but they have a lot more space unless you got a big ass kennel, you know, 20 by 20 or 24 by 24 for each dog. It's actually better to have them on the chain and, and the breed and dogs in general, because they've been chained up for over a hundred years, they're, it's it's natural to them, you know, it's not a big deal to most of them, you know. Even pups, you see that you put them on a chain and, and they fight it and they cry and whine after Sometimes that day, later that day, or the next day, or a couple of days, they're, they're fine with it. You know, they understand right. that, that, that they're confined, but at least they have a lot more freedom of movement. But making them aggressive, no. The uh, aggressive dogs are, are, are either born that way or they're made that way. You know, yeah, all the aggressive dog is just a dog that cranked on. My boy had his, raised his pit bull up in the house with a chihuahua. The dog turned 26 months. No more Chihuahua. I told him one day that dog gonna crank on. You raising them right. I mean, you got pictures of them with Easter Bunny ears, all that good old shit that we love to show the media, man. You know yeah. the fun side of the dogs. That motherfucker with the Easter Bunny ears on him, smack the shit out that little Chihuahua. You know, like it's gonna they just they they gonna come on or they not, bro. Simple as that. <laughs> yeah, and you know the the I think the dogs don't change to me. I personally feel like it gives the dogs uh, – they work themselves better. They exercise better. Yeah. Um, and, and, and people think that the dogs are more aggressive because when you walk into the yard, the dogs are pulling and tugging the chain. They're running back and forth. They're jumping up, jumping down. It's because they're excited. Yeah. They're excited. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, but in the kennel, they don't have that freedom to move around. The kennels, the kennels look nice and neat. They look nice and neat, real clean. But the dogs, are, the attitude is different. They, they don't have that range of motion, that freedom to move around. And, you know, I mean, I don't know why they got rid of the fucking chains. I, I just so stupid. I don't, I don't understand. It. Yeah. yeah. It's to cut down on, on the number of dogs, you know. Yeah, it's like change, a. Change a lot less expensive than a, than a kennel, you know. The investment, the, even the, the, the area that you have to provide and the cleanup and all that. You know, it just it's just a way for for the media and the and the SPCA and all that to to point to something negative about the breed, you know, and and like I said, it's been effective for so many years. All of a sudden, it's bad for them. It's never been bad for them. Confining animals, domestic animals, it's not bad for them. That's how you control them. You know, whether I don't care if it's cattle, chickens, you know, dogs, whatever it is. And for me, the best method is the chain because they got that. Even if you got a six foot chain, I don't know what the math is, but you got, you know, they can move all around in a circle. Right. In a, in a kennel, they're just, they're in that, whatever it is. That's all the, the yeah, area. Yeah, I believe they, they both have their purpose, you know. I mean, I like kennels too. I had them too. What I don't like is the fact someone telling me I can't keep my dog on a chain, you know. It's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. even some dogs are destructive on a chain you know you put them in a kennel they don't they're not destructive no more they settle down it kind of settles them down so they, yeah, they have exactly to... that's why i went i got a couple kennels just for those dogs they they chill as fuck on the kennel but on the chain and fight the chain bite the concrete all that bowl yeah. tear the house down yeah right. but in the kennel they fucking cool as hell i just 
notice since they get a little softer, I have to condition them just daily just to keep them in shape, which ain't no problem because I get fat if I don't work out, you know? What you say, Thompson? Exactly. Yeah, like I believe they both serve their purpose because I got, I got like 20 chain spots, but I still keep 15 kennels. I, I, I don't see cons in either one, really, because if you're going to kennel them, I believe you should be working them every day. If you're not working them every day or walking them, you know, the chain is sufficient because they'll make a lot of shit about the chains and stuff. But like the panel alluded to, these dogs, they can exercise, they can run, they can move. You know, a kennel, you know, it looks nice like Mr. Garcia said, but, you know, it can turn into a prison if you ain't working those dogs and they get soft and they don't have that same kind of feel to them living in that kennel. I personally prefer the chain, but like Ram alluded to, I got some motherfuckers over here. They'll beat the shit out they self on the chain. You know what I mean? They'll get collar rubbed. They're just very intense dogs. So I have to be alternating them in the kennel just for them to recover and sometimes just to get a little pudgy, you know, some of them work nonstop on that fucking chain. And I, I originally liked the kennel because I could control that work. Like we were talking about wind and having these dogs ready. You know, you can't take for granted that work that that dog is putting on that chain when you're not there. In that kennel, you could kind of identify, at least I got him in a situation where he can't be burning that much energy off before I work them. So I believe they're both great tools to the trade, but like the media and all the downplay on the chains, y'all don't say that about Huskies or any of those dogs out there in Alaska and they're tied up on six foot chains in the freezing cold and that's how they tether their animals. And me personally, exactly. I've had more kennel accidents fucking with those kennels than actual chains. So, yeah, because some, you know, some dogs just, are smart. They're smart. They know how to get out of them kennels and shit, man. Yeah, yeah, I got one that flipped latches and shit, man. Fucking watch yeah. you flip the latch and or figure out a way where they can run up the motherfucker and flip their body over the top and shit. It's all types of wild shit they be doing. Yep, man, I had a six bitch dog that could fucking get out the the, the black Walmart house kennels, man. That bitch would just lift the latch until it bounced backwards and then do it on the bottom. And I come home, that bitch be chilling on the couch. Like, what the fuck? Who let the goddamn dog out? Yeah, I, I had a dog that would get out. I had a kennel in my living room, all right? Uh, one of those, like, a you know, the little house kennels, right? Uh, so she in there, the little wire shit. Had her in there, and I, she would keep pushing it, and I knew she was trying to get out, so I put padlocks on the, uh, on the doors, right? One at the top, one at the bottom, right? So she couldn't push through that motherfucker. I came home one day, I saw fucking toilet paper, toys, shoes, everything in the living room. I'm, I'm like, what the fuck? But she's in the fucking kennel, right? So I'm like, what the fuck is going on? I go around the house. She took a big ass shit on the kitchen floor, right? So I'm like, what the fuck? How the who? Somebody let the dog out and put it back up. So I go over to the cage. I'm yelling at her. I, I grab, I'm getting ready to unlock it. And I realize. She has somehow opened up the kennel from the from the uh the side part, and then she can get back in and get out like a door, like a doggy door. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, what? The? I couldn't even get pissed off. I'm like, this is a smart ass dog. So yeah. I had to just I had to do something else with her, man. She just smart yeah. like that. You know what I mean? I've seen him get out of sky kennels, and the sky kennel still locked. You know, right? The, the door still latched on. They just wedge in between, push herself in. Small dog, but they just the kennel stays sky kennel stay closed and the dog's out of the kennel. Mm -hmm. They smart, they figure it out, you know. Yes, indeed. But, uh, yeah, well, especially you know, if you uh, leave them in there long enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, them dogs. Oh, salute to oh, Seth William, Calhoun. Uh, William Old School had a question too. He said, How you guys conditioned? He did things way different back in the day before we close it out. I ain't want to okay. leave the question hanging. Yeah, for sure. We got him. Salute to Seth Calhoun in that super chat. He says, Salute to the panel and welcome back to the family uh, reunion. Buck, hey, salute to the homie Buck City. Yeah, man, much love to Buck. Let me see. Yes, we got sir. Respect. William Old School. He says, uh, Here's a question How do you guys condition your dog? Says uh I did things completely different than most. Uh 
Should we? I think we got a, a video on conditioning. Who want to take that one first? Want to take that one, Mr. Garcia? How'd you condition dogs back in the day? Yeah, I uh, me, I worked on their wind first, you know, getting their getting their air built up, and then I worked on the strength. And I used, I lived out in the country, so I used a ten speed bike. You know, I had miles and miles, acres and acres. And uh, and then I did a thing called baiting. I, I, it's kind of repetitive, but I'd have my son in front of me with the dog, and then I'd walk behind him with my dog in a harness so they could pull and build up that strength. But the thing with condition is you want to, you know, uh, you know, I looked at it like this, you know, you look at your dogs just off the chain like that, you know, if I could improve their performance by 25%, I was good. And your dog should always look better in condition than it does off the chain, you know, and sometimes that don't happen, you know, mm -hmm. and I've done, I've done everything. I did a keep with swimming. I've used mills, you know, slap mill, carpet mill, throwing a ball, clerk pole, you know, the, the, the main thing I watched for was, you know, I keep repeating this too, was, was, uh, you know, breathing, heart rate and breathing, you know, and, and uh, there's, there's all kinds of method you can get that, but you have to get their, their, you have to be able to condition them hard enough where you get that heart pumping, you know, and, and, uh, you know, stuff like hand walking or email, that's good for endurance, but it doesn't raise that heart rate. So that's why you do a lot of times you do a combination of things, you know, and that was pretty much my method. You know, I've done spring pole work on their mouth and all that. I kind of left a lot of that out, you know, because they don't, you know, it, it can help a little, you know, but it won't make your dog a bone crusher, you know, and, and you have to be careful with it. You got to back off on that a week or two weeks before, because it'll make a muscle bound in their in their jaws, you know, and they, They'll end up biting with their front teeth rather than their whole mouth. But that's that's basically what I what I did, you know. Okay. What you say, uh, Ram? I did mine a little different. I would do my strength and conditioning first because of the conditioning I used that I learned from uh, Robert Lim and all them guys back in the day. You know, they did a lot of whole lot of sprint out, burnout, running and shit. They really wasn't big on adding strength to their dogs. So once I learned the basic, you know, how to operate their conditioning program and then get that right, I started doing my own strength and conditioning program ahead of that that I learned from one of the weight pool homies, you know, out of Cali. He's a real good brother. Got some real good snooty stuff. And he would compete at the highest level against them big ass fucking want to be a Whoppers and Camelot dogs and, you know, there's little snooty dogs coming in there pulling damn near just as much as them big motherfuckers, man. So he showed me the conditioning game for the strength, and I would just do that first, you know, build up all that strength, all that muscle, because I knew I was going to run a good 60% of that bulky lactic acid muscle off in my conditioning program. And I didn't want to come because I'm coming in railed out. I didn't want to be weak, you know. So I would fucking have the strength still and still, you know, be bigger. Even though I was more, you know, looking like John Jones as opposed to old fat ass Daniel Cormier. <laughs> Both good high level athletes, but, you know, John Jones go all night. Don't even take a breath and still be strong. And that's how, you know, if I was going to compare my dog to how a person would look, that's how it would be, you know, for me. That's just me, though, you know, don't. Don't try to be like me, man. That'd be fucking up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, you know, bulk looks good. It's pretty, you know? But bulk in in competition for dogs and even horses, you know? Bulk is not good. It's too heavy. You, you need a lot of oxygen, you know? Even even fighters, you know? Some are built that way. They're like, like Mike Tyson or Mike Weaver or even yeah. George, Clinton, you know, so that their fight is a different, but, but most fighters, you know, their, their muscles are long. They're not, you have to be able to maneuver, you know, well, just that, think of it like this. Have you ever seen a bulky greyhound ever in the history of greyhounds? No. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're swimmers, like swimmers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. They're fit. They're in good shape. They're strong. They got good air. But they ain't, there's not that bulk slowing them down, you know. If you got maybe a short, squatty, bully sun dog, you know, a short order cook, it can help them, but, but they're going to run out of gas faster, and they may not be able to recuperate from it, you know. It's all, it's all getting them to a certain level, recoup, getting them to a certain level, recruit. And, and I kind of looked at my conditioning the same way as a show, you know. Uh, uh, they're going to go through those phases, you know. The more time you can get them to, to tax their self and recoup from it on the fly while they're working, the better it is. And when you first start working a dog, they're going to blow hot in a certain amount of time. And their recuperation is going to take a certain amount of time. At the end of the keep, it should take them longer to burn hot, blow hot, and they should recuperate faster than they did at the beginning of the keep. That's how you, one way to tell that your dogs are in pretty good shape. Right, right, okay. What you say, Thompson? Shit. As far as keeps, the only thing I could kind of say is consistent would be feed with me, but it's really predicated on the dog. You know, every dog doesn't work the same. That's when a lot of people always ask me about keep putting dogs in keeps and trying to get their dogs in the, the best condition. It's really, to me personally, that's really when the dogs become individuals and whatever that dog, whatever you can use for that to manipulate that dog, to get him to work the way you want him to work, that's what you got to use. You got to figure out what they like the most out of all of the things that the panel brought up. You got cat mills, you got carpet mills, slat mills. You got people who like to use the, sw the spring poles. You got hand walking, you got swimming. There's a, a plethora of things that the, you can do to work these dogs, but you got to figure out what thing that dog loves to do the most. And that's the one that you can use to manipulate them to get them to do other things so you can broadband opening up your keep program but it's really an individual thing it's really predicated on the dog because i like the media and shit love to say we you you're making these dogs do this or you're making dogs gonna do what the fuck they want to do and what they don't want to do they're gonna let you know right away they ain't gonna do it so that that's my best advice to a person Cause it's nice to say you could oh do this that and the third but the dog has to take to those activities if it's not into it and it likes that activity the most that's what you got to base that keep for that dog around yes indeed good point yeah hey l fry uh no i wouldn't take any dog for when i would condition other people dogs i would have to physically see the dog first you know i'd have to see him perform first to even know if he was worth being put in keep because that's 12 weeks of my life I'm about to give that dog, man. You know, then I would have to, after I seen him, when he recouped and recovered, I had to spend, you know, like two months with him just, you know, with a trade dog. It'd be like both of ours, but he'd just be at my house. That way I could, you know, get to know him, <laughs> see what type of dog he was. Right, so, right. yeah, I don't just be taking any old dog, like, Cause I didn't have, I used to, and I ended up conditioning the cur and motherfucker. Oh man, that motherfucker used the cur nigga back in school. That motherfucker was a buster, you know. And this motherfucker ain't had a heart enough to make the hard call, you know. And I'm going off his word that he a bulldog. I'm working with me shit, and that motherfucker pack it on up and pull the U-Haul truck up, you know, and get up <laughs> out of there. Fuck that. Mm -hmm. I ain't doing that shit no more. You got, you got one time with me. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. I'm gonna label you the cur master after that because you keep yeah. curves. <laughs> hey, hey, snacks B. Nah, man, I couldn't give you my curves, bro. I, I get kicked out the fraternity if I gave yeah. a cur away. <laughs> uh, that's a good point. It's a learning process, you know. I think we've all anybody with any experience has done that. You know, you take dogs and you got to work with them, do this and do that. Me, I'm kind of an asshole that way. If a dog don't like to work, whatever it is, don't have the desire for for work i don't like them you know and i eventually stop stop using them you know stop letting people you know they give me dog i get them and just hook them up sometimes wouldn't even look at them you know <clears throat> and i had success winning and losing but i just like a dog that, that has that intent to work that 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 you know, like i said what it, whatever it is you're gonna have to find out what they can do or what they like to do you know 
But if they have that desire to work, that's the kind I want. You know, one of the best conditioners or the best that I ever seen, I ain't going to say his name. You know, he, he used to tell me, you know, if a dog can't do an hour's work off the chain, I ain't going to use them. Now, that, that sounds kind of cruel, harsh, stupid, whatever you want to say. But that was his standard. And he had a lot of success doing that. The blood didn't matter. It was just the attitude of the dog. They killed they me for that, to... Mr. Garcia. I said I like dogs that like... <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I said I like dogs that love to work. I said I love dogs that like to work, and that's what I breed and try to keep around. If you don't like to work, I don't want you fucking around. And everybody had, I mean, they just came for me like, what the fuck? Like, I was speaking Spanish or something. Like, yeah. the dog should want to work. Like, that should be a criteria in a breeding program. Why? Exactly. Where's all these lazy motherfuckers at? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's part of the breeding, too. You know, that that that's part of these standards we're talking about, you know, something you don't like. I don't like dogs that don't like to work. I don't like lazy dogs. And I don't mean a dog that's calm with the dog. The best dog, the dog that I had that I produced that had the best air was calm. He wasn't the kind of run on the chain, this and that. But when it was time to work, he was a go getting motherfucker. He would work and he was real conservative and, and he could breathe underwater, man. He, he just, you know, never came out of hope always on his feet most of the time and just knew how to control his breathing and just had that good natural air. But he was a good worker too. And I've had others, shit, they don't want to do nothing, man. They just, you know, they scared to walk on the lead. And so it's just, it's a hassle. And that's not really representative of the breed. People look at that like a, like a, you know, like, a, exactly. A, you know, like something An good. Anomaly. To do this. That, that, that. He lazy and all that. I don't like, you know, that. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, hell no. That dog should have been cold, man. It, you know, yeah. shouldn't well, I, be bred or nothing. Yeah, that that I I I borrowed him from Don Broke, and he was scared of his own shadow. The only thing I could do was get him to work a flirt pole while he was on his chain. And I won with him. And after he was done, oh, I sent him right back to Don. He told you don't want to use him again. Hey, I don't know, man. I was lucky to get that one, man. You know. <laughs> I just, I just, I ain't going to, no, you know, but, but they should be eager workers. And one of the things I did with mine is I lived out, everything was open out in the country. So when I was taking the older dogs out to work, the younger ones could see what I was doing. So it was just natural to them when it was their time, they just hit it just like that, natural. They go, they go and do the same work because they saw the older ones do it and they wanted to emulate it. They're jealous and, you know, all that attention and time and all that. You know, so it was an easy transition, you know, and, and you can do that with, with, you know, same thing. I love that mill. manipulation. Yeah. <laughs> you, put, you put a dog on a mill, you put another one, you know, a younger one in a crate, just let him walk. He'll just jump on there. When it's his time, he'll jump on there and start running that mill, you know. Because he's going to want to get all the praise and the pets that you're giving that dog on the mill when he does great, you know. I don't want to leave that part out like I'll. Sound like a fucking goddamn happy Kathy when I'm working my dog. They get all the, the happy voice and all that shit, man. Exactly. And all the other dogs get jealous of that. And they be like, fuck that. I'm going to run. I'm going to burn that bitch. That meal the yep. fuck out. Watch this exactly. when I get up there. Exactly. They want that praise. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I even, I even. Yeah, but the old head told me that years ago that you should always work your dogs around your dogs. Yeah. Yeah. I would even, uh, you know, Again, this is back in the day, things were different, but I had a permanent box outside uh, in, in my back patio. On one side, I had one for, for the dogs. On the other side, I had one for roosters, right? And they were always set up. So I would take dogs w w and, and play tug of war. I'd put them in the box and play tug of war with them with the old pan Levi pants, right? Tie knots in it like that. And I'd... I'd work that tug of war and they'd get familiar with the box where the walls are corners, all that. And they'd move all around, you know, I'd pull them, push them, let them work themselves into a corner. They're pulling that, that tug and they'd have to get up and move around, maneuver around, you know, and it's just that mental conditioning just to familiarize them. So I'm not telling anybody to do it now. I'm just talking about mental. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this you, was back you, in the day. You do that shit now, boy. You going directly to jail. Do not pass go. <laughs> I swear to God, you set the box up to go. 
Yeah. Well, even mills, you know, they, they, they that's a tool for dog fight. Well, how come cops use a mill with their dogs? You know, they can use yeah. them. Yeah. You know, they realize that's a good working tool. And even in our in this little town here, they have two treadmills that the cops use. You know, my my cousin's Man. a sergeant in. My Malinois run the mill better than some of my bulldogs now, man. That motherfucker, he'd get up there and burn that bitch down. I'll be having to take them off. That's true. That's true. So he ain't biting shit but people. He yeah. ain't dog aggressive at all. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it's just some things, you know, it's all, you got to get in the mind of a dog, you know. You got you to gotta get in their head. And you got to bond with them and, and, and you got to, you know, learn what, what they're thinking. You know, you can see it in their eyes, basically, you know, a lot of things, you know, whether they're tired, excited, you know, going to quit, all, all that stuff. So if you pay attention to them and their body language, you know, and all that, if you pay attention to them, they'll show you. But that takes time and experience, you know, and that's one the thing. I never lie. You know, this ain't no short term shit. The average time span for people involved with the breed is five years. You get past that mark, you might stay with it. Most people get out before that. They just, you know, for whatever reason, and I'm not knocking them for it. I'm just saying everything takes time. Preach. And learning is, is the hardest part, you know. Man, most people get out you because cut your of ass out real quick days. if you ain't cut for it. Yeah, yeah right. for real. Like most yeah, motherfuckers should, be expected to get a bulldog in, out. in twelve months, and it's fucking. You got another twenty four months to wait to see if you got a bulldog. Sometimes, bro, that's three years. Like yep. one more year, you could have went and got a fucking college degree waiting on a yep. fucking dog. You know, <laughs> that's true. Exactly. But you know, at three years, they're better than they are at two years. You know. And, I, and, I, I know that, but shit, most motherfuckers, man, they show up with a, a puck in shape. Yeah. Like, man, what is you doing? This, macho buck is an anomaly, man. Every dog got macho buck. Yeah, that's right. There, there are some young dogs that have been done, and, and you can you know, do that with Take them. a lot Again. of time and patience, man, and a lot of money. Yeah. yeah it'll, it'll, break, it'll break you. It will. And if you got to break your heart, if you got a dog you love and he just uh, fucking mud up on you when it's man, time to a, be a gangster, that shit is heartbreaking. And you not a boy dog, you will cur out. You will think, yep. oh man, I can't keep doing this. Yeah, and fucking, you will be a cur with a cur in the cur yeah. pile. That's true. That's Are you thing. talking about that's if everything goes the way it's supposed to fucking go? Because I mean, shit, I didn't see motherfuckers leave because they had a bad accident. Had great dog, something happened, cut loose, and one dog don't make it. Anything can happen with these dogs. I mean, some of them, it's a battle just keeping them alive from keeping them from exactly. killing themselves. So you know, imagine we talking three them years. You got to actually get through the three fucking years. Spider, just, yeah, it's gonna yeah. be a rough three yeah, years man. with these Shit dogs. <laughs> it's it's uh, you know, one guy his he had a badass bitch. Her name was Peach. She was three time winner. She was. I mean, she, you, you see, you like everything about her. And she got older and he mastered heavy. Well, she lost. After that, he got rid of everything. He just could not handle it. Too emotional for him. You know, he thought she was unbeatable. And under the right conditions, she might have been. She, she was tops, man. I'm telling you. One of the best I've seen. But it was so emotional for him, he, just, he got rid of everything. Never had a dog again, you know. That's just, that's what it can do to you. Yeah, yeah I had a partner had a rattlesnake get loose on his. I had a, I had a partner get a rattlesnake cut loose on his yard. Must have fucking hit about three, four of his best dogs, and they died, man. And he he never came back from that shit. He got out of it. He was like, yeah. man, it was that shit is an act of God. He was yeah. like, I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that shit have pissed me off too. Shit, a lot to it, you know. Yeah, we talk it, you know, and we walk it, but it's a hard fucking walk. You know, it's real yeah. easy to talk to these dogs, but like, I just yeah. got off work, man. I got to go clean up shit, <laughs> fill water bowls, and prep some food. You know, I'm tired than a motherfucker. Still yeah, I got, got another bust. job to do. I yeah. got bust, I got bust move myself. I'm going to answer this brother question real quick, though. 
if anybody want to take this question here, salute to Chris Campbell in that super chat. Much love, much appreciation, man. He says, peace to the chat. The prodigal son has returned. Let me tell you, it ain't uh, no place like home. He says, can a, uh, um, a one-year-old pup recover from um, laxing, uh, laxing patella naturally or surgery is the only option? That's like a knee problem or something, ain't it? Ain't that like a knee issue with, in the puppy or some shit? I think that's what that is. Anybody mm. know what that is? Mm. That sounds like some surgery shit, bro. You got to take your dog to the vet, homie. If the vet diagnosed it with that shit... I think you the, hacked the shit out of what it was. I can't see shit, but I think you... Ha- I don't know what the fuck... What does it say? Lacatella? What the fuck you said? I, I know <laughs> patella... I know, I know patella means knee. So, I, so I'm assuming it got to be like a knee issue or something. Right. Oh man, I don't know. I, I take my dog to the vet so much, bro. Like, man, I don't. I ain't never had none of them type of problems. To be honest, I don't know if I'm lucky or I just be on this shit so much. Anything go wrong that I can't fix? If I ain't got it in my fucking medicine cabinet for the dogs, twenty four hour vet here the fuck we come, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the best advice. You know, the only way to tell is... Yeah, to, I, I, they, you know, I don't know. If it is a joint issue or ligament tear or something like that, I it could possibly recover, but still, you know, any type of heavy work with that dog, if it's a joint issue, that injury could come back, you know? Yeah, that's a, yeah I'm looking it everybody up. Ain't Adrian, everybody ain't Adrian Peterson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. everybody, everybody ain't Adrian Peterson. So you can get a surgery and come back. <laughs> Find, find out what it is. Know, if, it's, uh, if, if you do get the surgery, yeah, yeah. Find out what it is. yeah that's a lot. Because you, you know, yeah, I mean, like you know, any type of joint issues with those dogs, it's just dangerous. Yeah, yeah. no, I'm looking it up right now. You know, I don't like talking about shit I don't know. But yeah, it's a it's a knee issue, bro. If he's a year old and he's still having problems, just go get the surgery while he's still young, bro. That way he got a whole, you know, couple years he can recover and bounce back, you know, get you get used to walking on that leg the right way and all that, bro. I'm looking that shit up right now. They yeah. say he should if surgery is recommended, some is a low percentage is saying that uh come out of it naturally, could grow out of it. But uh yeah, if he still got it at a year old, just gonna get the minor surgery, bro. Yeah, it cost a couple hundred though, but it, it's worth it, you know. If it's a, a dog that you you know you invested in, you feel me? You can't tell if he's a good dog or not yet because it's a pup. Right. But you know, take care of your dog, man. He might be the next goddamn motherfucking uh, macho buck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll you know before it get to that point because if it if it does fuck up, it's gonna fuck up during the conditioning. So you don't know yeah, way before exactly. you even get to the final day. Yeah, and then you know you you paying that that price. Then now you know because you didn't already set your fee on what it'll cost if somebody back out. So there it is. There it's better just to take care of all the shit you can ahead of time. Yeah, but yeah, that could be a serious problem though. You know, it could cause yeah. amputation. The further yeah. it goes, you know, and it gets worse and worse. So unless you want a fucking three wheel dog, you know. Yeah, I handle that shit. You got to understand that any you might have all these investments in the dog and they might turn to shit. That's something you have to be willing to to expect and deal with. But if you don't take care of the problem, then you're always going to be wondering, you know, what what if? What if? Maybe I should have done it earlier. Maybe I should have, you know, if you're waiting for him to grow out of it, he might, but might not. So it's that investment we always talk about. You're going to lose money, you know, but you're taking a chance that that will help the dog recoup from it, and hopefully you can work them. If you can't, then you just take the loss, do what you're going to do with the dog. Maybe you keep them anyways. That don't matter. You know, that's okay. But you have to understand that there's a lot that you put into it, and sometimes there's no reward for it. But on the overall picture, you know, you should end up with good, healthy dogs. You know, you should should have some success somewhere. You just got to stick at it. You know, I tell people it took me seven years to learn how to properly condition a dog. And I tell, well, maybe I'm slow, maybe I'm stupid, but in my mind, that's how long it took me before I knew what the hell I was doing. Right. You got to stick with it, man. 
Shit, see, it took Robert Lim to come in and physically show me how the fuck he did it, and I had his videos and shit. But just yeah. seeing him do it, totally different, you know? Once I go. seen him actually doing it, like, oh, it clicked, like, okay, yeah. boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Let's go. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us on This is a Good good Show, man. Um, um, Make sure y'all tune in next Thursday. I'm not going to be able to uh, keep up the Sunday shows, man, unfortunately. But Thursday, next Thursday, make sure y'all tune in for episode 35. We're going to keep this thing going, keep on cooking, man. Salute to the panel. Salute to the brother Blitz. Make sure y'all follow him on Instagram. Blitz, what's, what, tell the people where they can find you. Uh, Blitz08, Blitz underscore 0820. Uh, Highlight me up there. Yes, indeed. And, uh, um, uh, thank you to uh, schoolboy Mr. Richard Garcia uh, for coming through. Salute to the brother Ram, always through here. Salute to my brother Thompson Kennels, and we'll holler at y'all next week, man. Get up out of here. All right. Salute everybody, and I enjoyed it. It was a good one. Yes, it is. Peace. Peace. Peace.